Hi, I'm here with Wayne Gilbert at the G-Spot Contemporary Art Space. Space, thank you. He's a gallerist in Houston, well known. His shows get good reviews. And um, what I thought we'd talk about today is how he picks his artists. And I'll let him answer that. How do you pick your artists? Well, that's a very good question because we have a pretty severe supply and demand scenario anymore. Small demand, big supply. And I pick my artists primarily because I like what I see. Uh, it has often has to have the aesthetics that I think are to my pleasure. And the reason I say that is because I pay the bills here and so I get to do what I want to do. Uh, but it's kind of a difficult thing to do because so many different things come into play. Um, it, that's, it, it, it's, really kind of problematic because there are reasons sometimes I'll select an artist that I might not particularly be as fond of the imagery as much as I'm as per perhaps fond of his aesthetic uh, prowessness or his willingness to jump off the ledge or somehow it might even have to do with his academics and the fact that he has done something that I think is above and beyond everybody else. So it's really kind of hard to really a encapsulator, get to the bottom line. I, I noticed that with the people you pick, some people are pure artists, some are philosopher artists, right. um, some are um, draftsman artists, and uh, th there's always a good range here. And um, how do you go about finding your artists? They find me. They find you? 99 times out of 100. Uh, sometimes um, it, it, there's many ways they find you as there are ways they find you. I mean, it's just it's keeping if you're if you dive into the middle of the art world, and that's pretty much what I've done just out of my unexplained enjoyment. I can't even put my finger on why I'm a part of this world, except mm -hmm. that uh, it's some sort of psychic reality that I don't understand. And I don't suspect most people in the world really understand why they're part of art, because you know, art at the end of the day is pretty much non-functional. It's just not practical. It's just art. So I say that because um, I, if I pass through as much as I do in the art world, things just step up to the plate. And when they do, uh, they either register or they don't register, or perhaps they don't register right now, but they register later. So it's not real easy to really answer that question either. It's just, uh, uh, it has been my experience that sometimes things happen to me that are natural mm -hmm. and I just sort of accept them if they feel right. I uh, also noticed that um, you started out totally differently than a lot of the galleries in town and um, they had stables of yeah. artists, but you show a person once or five times and it, you don't have a contract or anything. Well, the truth of the matter is, I think if you were to look deeply in the art world, gallery world, now you'd find out that there aren't near as many contracts as there used to be. The entire uh, world of art galleries has changed so dramatically in the years to go. Because what happened is, is that say 30, 40 years ago, you had this sort of drifting collector group that sort of almost in a way delightfully uh, competitively bought art and went to a lot of events together and as they've grown older and that there's new generations of people they don't quite do that anymore and I, I suspect that has something to do with the digital media and the sort of the disparaging way that we interrelate anymore but regardless of that um, in the old days you had to have maybe if you say a stable of 18 artists and you had agreements with them, you had to show them at least every year or two. Mm -hmm. And if you actually ended up with people collecting their work and you ran out of your sort of, let's call it a customer base, you didn't really have any way to enlighten another group of people except through phone calls or, you know, uh, beating people in the head when they come around and see what you can do. So. The truth is, is that what happened was, is that it became more and more difficult to have it. So what happens more often than not, 
in most of these galleries, I think, and I'm only talking from observation, I don't know this to be the case, um, is that they probably show people they've gotten a relationship with over the years that they so come back to. Uh, and this was the exception of a few galleries that are still part of the yesteryear. But it's not like it used to be. But there's a customer right there calling me. So anyway, the point is, is that it's not, it's not, uh, used to be, of course, see, in the old days, before the uh, enlightened era of more people knowing about art than need to know about art in order to make it valid to sell it, uh, you used to be able to sort of infer in a weird way the possibility that your artist would have a secondary market someday and be worth more money than what you paid for it, which obviously would interest somebody more when they bought it than somebody saying they just have indiscretionary income and are willing to give you X number of dollars for that piece of art because they like it. And that's purely it. And now today we can't do that anymore because it's just not, you can try, but if you track art and artists like I do, and you see that even those very few that have perhaps acquired a larger name recognition than all the rest of them, and you try to find out anything about their collector base, 99% of all of their art is bought by first time buyers, a couple of, but very seldom do any of them have a secondary buyer. So it, it's just, it's just like everything else as we've grown more open in our information world. It's just that more people know about it so they don't deal with it quite the same way they used to. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of hard to put your finger on, but that's it. You're, you're also a rarity in the art world that you're an artist also, an yeah. artist gallerist. Most um, gallerists come from art history, design, um, even sociology and philosophy. Well, the truth is I have a degree in painting and a minor in art history. Uh, and I went back to school rather late in my life at 36, which is most kids are out of school when they're 25 or something like that. And so uh, having had this sort of psychic occurrence somewhere prior to going back to school about art, uh, when I got back to it, uh, I had already established a company. My wife and I have a company which in truth, sort of makes the money to lose the money in the art business, which mm -hmm. is unfortunate. We normally do well enough over the year to not be too much of a burden, but as keeping with it, it's in all honesty, it, it's, you're never quite sure. The funny thing about the way you sell art anymore is you can go through a, you, and this doesn't have anything to see the quality of art, by the way, it has to do with some other sort of mystical thing. You can go through a show or two where you only have a few sales and you don't know what's going on. Then you can have a show and you sell a lot of it. And it sort of takes, covers some of the other months. So if, when the year's all out and you get it based out, it, it, it kind of takes care of itself, provided you're interactive enough with it. But in, in spite of all that, I went back to school uh, after we had opened our business. And uh, I don't know why, but I just, like to make art and I make art that's a little different than most people in the world. Mm -hmm. I know, I know. Yeah. Um, one last thing before we go is who's the artist who's surrounding you? This is Leandra de Buelna and he is 82 years old. Uh, again, he's a clear example of how sometimes artists show up. Uh, I have a documentary out on my artwork um, that played at the Museum of Fine Arts in November of last year, um, 2018. And um, in, when the documentary was over, a guy walked up to me and wanted to know if I could find a filmmaker. And I said, well, yeah, I know, obviously I could find a filmmaker because I just had a film, but why? And he said, well, I have this artist. I'd like to show you some, I'd like to get a little documentary made. And I said, well, show me some images. So he showed me some of Leo's images and uh, turns out Leo was a veteran of the Korean War and the Vietnam War and essentially uh, just is an artist. That's all he's ever done. I think he might have had some kind of a, you know, some kind of a thing that he got from the government after the war, but that helps him make a living because turns out he never did have any gallery relationships except for one. But when I went over and found his work, I got pretty interested in it because 
Uh, again, uh, I, I generally am kind of, when I look at art, I'm critical on several layers and several levels. And one of them is sometimes one of the things that fascinates me more than just the imagery is the, the actual um, application of the materials. And one of the things that not only, if you obviously look at all Leo's images, you'll see originality of his own kind that uh, parallels nothing that I see often, um, but that you, if you really look at the way he handles oil, and if you've ever been an artist yourself and had a big old clump of thick oil and realize the difference in the way it takes to apply it all the way down to a drop, and then you look at his actual application and see that some of these things look like they're done with one bristle. And that's not altogether the important thing, but there's lots of it and it's all done without mistake. And that you can see it, so it's really a quite fascinating artist. Yeah, it, it, it truly is. <laughs> It's, well, thank you, Wayne, for yeah. taking the time, and uh, it was a joy. Well, I enjoyed giving you. you the benefit of my negativity, <laughs> which unfortunately is not the way I feel most of the time, but it's sometimes uh, if you're in the business of making a world of art, you just have to live with all the different aspects of it. Very, very true. So thank you again. Yeah, my pleasure. Bye-bye. Okay.